Hi, everybody. It's Ayla. Welcome to Wife with a Purpose. Today, I have an interview with Tom Kaczynski, and I am so excited about this interview. I can't tell you. I've been waiting for it for a couple of weeks now, and we are going to be talking about his new book. And as a mom and a homeschooler, I'm so excited that people are writing books about the real history of America, and that's what Tom has done. So before we jump into it, of course, wifewithapurpose.com. Please visit there if you want to see any of my social media links. I've also got my social media links down in the description box. If you'd like to support the channel, all the links, uh, wifewithapurpose.com forward slash support. You'll find all of the ways to support this channel so I can keep bringing you great content. Um, And um, don't forget to share this video. Give it a thumbs up. Um, tell us what you think in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on the chat as well. So we'll be taking your questions and, um, I hope you guys are having a wonderful Monday too. Um, it, this last week of May, if you can believe it already. All righty. So let's jump right into this. I'm so excited. So for those who might not know your backstory, cause I think that that's an important lead up to talking about your book. So let's briefly cover, you know, who are you, Tom? And like, why did you write this book? And, you know, how did you get into this position where you felt like this was an important book to write? Gladly, Ayla. And I just want to say thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I've been looking forward to this as well. So we're gonna have a good time today. Um, My name is Tom Kaczynski, and I used to be the town manager for Jackman, Maine. I ended up uh, getting fired from my position because I spoke out against Islam. I spoke up for freedom of association and people got mad at me for taking a pro-white position and a pro-Western civilization position. So after I got fired from my job, I've had some time to think about why this happened. And I wanted to share with people how we got to a point in American culture where up is down and left is right. And you can't say what you think without getting fired. You know, believing the same things our founders believed will end up getting you judged as a victim, or excuse me, as someone who practices hate speech, whereas you're saying the very things this country was founded upon. And it isn't an accident we got to this point. And so with my new book, Someone Has to Say It, The Hidden History of How America Was Lost, we talk about the last 100, 110 years, and how the state has ever grown by dividing people against one another, and by making itself the solution to problems we never used to have. So we'll go into some of that today, but uh, as someone who has uh, been on the fringes now and uh, is fighting back as best he can, uh, that's that's a big part of what I wanted to do was let people know, you know, that what we have in America and we're told is normal is entirely unnatural. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think this message is so important. And one of the reasons I started speaking out about these uh, similar topics about three years ago on social media and other platforms and YouTube, of course, was because I I was noticing, you know, I'm rapidly too rapidly approaching the age of 40 myself. And so I'm about 20 years out of high school. Things were already quite liberal when I was in high school. But I do feel that there was a little bit of a sense of getting both sides of an argument um, back then. Uh, Definitely the liberals were given more weight and more uh, validity, particularly from the public education system. But then I noticed that there's this new crop of adults that have grown up while I've been an adult. So people who were very young when I graduated high school or had not yet been born are now entering adulthood and they're making um, decisions. They're going into careers, they're starting families or whatever they're doing. And they have been given not at all any information. They haven't even been given given the two sides of the story. They haven't been given any other alternative other than incredibly indoctrinating leftist, radically liberal talking points. And they literally have no idea that a counter argument exists. And that was one of the reasons that I started speaking out because at first, first about anti-feminism and then later about, you know, pro-white issues, pro-American issues, um, anti-immigration, anti-Islam, because these, you know, I thought, well, you know, it's one thing to be heavily indoctrinated by liberalism, but at least be aware of the counter argument. That's the way I was able to eventually make my way to conservative thought was that, you know, yeah, I I got all of this stuff, but, but eventually the information was there. And now, you know, they silence the information. They're literally erasing our history. Um, Things that I used to be able to Google, um, research studies, scientific studies, um, historical information that used to be just able to type into Google and you could pull up 
all, you know, all of these research studies and things like that. They literally uh, recently when I was writing pieces for squawker.org, I'm like, oh, let me go pull up that article. I go to Google it and it's been scrubbed from the internet. Like these things, they don't exist anymore. They're completely erasing our history. And young adults now who are involved in a lot of these radical leftist groups as well, like Antifa and things like that, they're 23, 24, 25 years old, and they've never heard, honestly, the truth. They've grown up in this liberal leftist bubble where no other side was ever, ever even penetrated that bubble at all. And so they live in this completely far left fantasy land. Um, and so it's, it's amazing to me. You were saying that, you know, now what the founding fathers believed is, is considered hate speech. And I would say even things that the, the left believed only 10 and 20 years ago is now considered hate speech. It's gone so far radically left. Has that been your experience? Well, yeah, you know, the thing about the left is they move at whatever speed you allow them to move, but they only ever move in one direction. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of their worst habits were at least somewhat constrained while the Cold War was still ongoing. You know, you're close to my age, I believe, so you probably remember in the 80s where being American was cool, you know? And yes. <laughs> true America, and red was a bad word, and now it's gotten conflated into something where it means Republican, where it used to mean someone you shot on sight, you know? <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, these kids grew up in a world where there was only ever one vision, and starting, I think, really in the 90s, you know, when you had the whole Prozac thing and the real world and, and you know, alternatives start happening, you had people become disassociated. And uh, we've seen it sort of advanced past then. And I, I remember, you know, a lot of it, like take race is just one example of it. You know, maybe things were, you know, uh, one way in the 60s, but, you know, by the 80s, things seemed like they had sort of reached equilibrium in a lot of ways where, you know, it didn't seem like as big of an issue, or at least that went to the early 90s. But what happened was power was given to people on the left and they just kept pushing further and further, you know? Same with the gay lobby. They just wanted to be tolerated. Now they want marriage. And now if you don't bake them a cake, you're going to jail. And that's what's happened. It's been a power trip where the very, uh, I would say, acquiescence of the right has really enabled this. Because the left says, we have a vision for the future and we want this. And most figures on the right just say, well, we're going to try to preserve the past. But what those children haven't had or haven't been exposed to is a vision of the future that is right leaning, you know, mm -hmm. where we have met, excuse me, where we have morals and values and where we have something to look forward to as well. And that's why it's so important what you and I are doing. And that's why this book was so important, too, because it showed how they took control. And in one way, it kind of makes the argument that we can't do things the old way to, to get it back. We can't just hope people will go back to you know, the good old days, because there's no way for them to do it. Mm -hmm. The churches aren't there like they used to be. Civil society is controlled by the left. Go into any nonprofit and see what they teach or what ideas they offer. And so it's going to take some brave people out here on an edgy counterculture. And we're a very strange assembly of people, right? We have people ranging from, from good figures like yourself who, you know, go out there and put up a very clean message to some admittedly very edgy people who maybe go a bit extreme, but they're expressing the outrage that I think young people justifiably have in that they've been taught something that doesn't fit the facts of their reality, you know? Oh, exactly, exactly. You know, and a lot of the, the left likes to make a, a lot of noise about the the 15 year old, you know, um, Nazi LARPer that's, you know, um, spewing sure. hate speech on Gab. But I, I, I look at that and, and whereas, you know, I, I don't, you know, it's not really my, my message or, or my cup of tea. What I see happening with the youth right now is they're being pushed far right and far radical because especially young white men are growing up and, and even non-white men uh, are growing up in our country right now and being told that to have conservative values, to want to have a, a girlfriend and then to get married and have children and to be a Christian, all of these things are like you're literally the devil. You're, you're, you're evil you're, and you're hated and you're hated for being white and, and male and heterosexual. And so... Um, so they, they kind of have almost, these, they're kind of given these two choices, the young kids these days. It's like they can either just, you know, give in to that degenerate leftism and then, you know, claim they're bisexual or something like we recently saw with the Santa Fe shooter who, you know, kind of latched onto communism and bisexuality and atheism and kind of, you know, try to be uh, embraced by this, you know, new uh, norm of leftist thought or 
um, just fully embrace this radical right, which which basically, I mean, the radical quote unquote right means that, you know, you just want to be a white heterosexual male and, and get married and have a family. And that's considered, you know, extremism and, and not only extremism for your own life, but you're considered, you know, our young men are telling are being told by, like you said, just about every institution in our society, whether it's church or the nonprofits or public schooling or, you know, just be random people on the street. They're being told that them wanting that, that them wanting to be just a, a, a heterosexual white male who, who gets married and has kids, that they're not only hurting themselves, but that they're oppressing, somehow oppressing the entire society by doing that. And every time a black man shoots another black man in Chicago, it's, it's somehow their fault for being, you know, a white heterosexual male. And they're really pushing back against this. And and I think that, you know, when I, when I see those extremist messages, as much as I disagree with them, I also say the left needs to own what they're doing because a lot of these people are incredibly young they're teenagers and they've been told their whole lives by every institution in their life that they're scum that not only they personally scum but they are responsible personally for every bad thing that's happening in our country and it's pushing them towards radical extremism and it was the responsibility of the adults in the society to not put that on the shoulders of children their entire lives because that's how you get people like mass school shooters and and other wounded emotionally and mentally wounded people that are going to these extremes and um you know they're then turning around the leftist press and media and culture that has done this to these children they're then turning around and using these children's gab accounts or twitter accounts as evidence that people like you and i are some kind of far-right fascist nazis that are you know one step away from gassing the jews and it's absolutely ridiculous no, it, it absolutely is. And, you know, there, there's two reasons why they do that. Um, and, and the book covers this in some detail, but it, it's as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. What the left does is they find ways to destroy private means of authority, right? So they, they start with the family, this idea that you have a husband and a wife that's the center of the family and the family's the basic social unit. So what do they do? They, sell, they tell all the women, why don't you go work? And what happens out of that? Well, men and women are now competing against each other instead of collaborating. Instead of raising kids, television is raising kids. So all of these things happen that have a benefit to people who want the state to be running things. And what you see is in a hundred different ways, they find everything that connects us and disconnects, and then they disconnect us intentionally from one another. So all we have is the capacity to listen to the message they put out there, or I hate to say it, they allow certain radical messages to go out there to be a sort of oppositional focus to try to keep people onto a straight and narrow path they've determined. But as you said, it's, it's a path they've created where they've basically had to say, the civilization that we've built is bad, white people are responsible for anything and everything, and that the left is always good because we care, and that it is so bad what we believe we are not, are not even allowed to be heard anymore because that would be to enable the worst uh, tendencies within us. And so when I think about it, and when I wrote about it, I realized that we need to go ahead and, and have these communications, have these conversations, and present a message to our young people and to homeschoolers, especially where they understand this is not what was intended in America, but rather this was the deliberate effort of a group of people who want to have control over you, me, and everyone. And it's important to remember in this that it's not just that they're targeting what they do. Their end game is control. So what they try to do is they find disaffected groups. You know, it go to the 1930s. The disaffected groups were poor rural white people. And Franklin Roosevelt went to them and said, hey, I'm going to help you against those rich New England Republicans. And he went there and they built a whole bunch of jobs for them and promised a whole bunch of things. You know, these are people they appealed to with God's gun and religion back in the day, but they did it because that way you could build the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this, what the state has done over and over again, and, and the Marxists who kind of guide the pathway, who control the media, who control the nonprofits, who control the local government and a lot of the federal bureaucracy, was they would go intentionally and they would find whoever was unhappy and motivate them to use the government to create a new program. And every time there was a new program, what happens is that program took the place of what you could do by charity or private enterprise or family. And so when it's all said and done, even if you want the private alternative, it doesn't exist anymore. And 
The left says the state does a great job taking care of it. And the right says, I pay taxes for that. I'm not going to spend any more money. And at the end of the day, the Marxists run our countries. And we've gotten to the point now where, you know, they use nonprofits to import people from the third world to replace us. They're creating a problem so they can suggest a solution. And it, it's sad because they're doing it against the interests of all Americans. I mean, whites predominantly, but even if you're a minority, let's say you actually are a descendant of a slave, what do you have in common with a Somali immigrant other than the fact that they say, you know, you're just both victims? The truth is that person is going to be competing for jobs against your Latino migrant farm worker, against, you know, other poorly educated people. And we could spend the money on the people here on education, on job training, on anything rather than bringing in more people. But the left does this because they want more votes. The right does it because they like the cheap labor. And at the end of the day, you find the people who write the checks kind of control both sides and take a very transactional view of government. And the sad thing is we've reached a point in America where we have an oligarchy where a few people are well represented and the rest of us are all set against one another. And I think we need to change that and that people need to take pride in themselves as individuals find uh, strength in their family, in their identity, whatever it is. I am a white man who's proud to be white, but I don't begrudge other people who feel the same way and build up through their communities a way and understanding where we say, hey, wait a second, what they're telling us isn't right. And, you know, you as a homeschooler can appreciate this. It requires us to have conversations where we go outside the system. We look at things differently. And my book was written as a resource to help people. You know, I've spent uh, the better part of a decade hanging around some dark corners of the Internet and some books that are, you know, some that are very old and famous and some that are very new and infamous. But learning a lot of facts that don't fit the narrative. And, and what I tried to do was to write the narrative as it really was, or at least as I believe it to be, which is that the state deliberately destroyed all authority so that it could take control so that a few people could run everything and have a relatively stable system as we all are stuck fighting one another just to survive as we like you know this from the 80s 90s you know it's funny every time we're told technology will make our life better it just makes it more complicated and we're told things will get cheaper but money never goes as far so at some point people need to ask what's the scam who to blame and really point their efforts in the right direction and, you know, I, I've been involved in politics. I think people do good work there, but it really has to happen with direct action. We change how we think and how we behave. We educate our kids properly. You know, we honor our families. We work in our communities. That's when things happen. And, and you know, up here in New England, you know, uh, as, as well as some other people, I worked with my new Albion project to get people excited about that. We went offline specifically because people didn't want to be judged and chastised for saying things. But I guarantee you, people are still working and gathering together because people ask me more than any other question, when are we going to start standing up for ourselves and demand that we get back to the America we were promised? Oh, yeah, definitely. I agree. I think that it's really interesting. My husband and I went out for lunch the other day and we were having a conversation along this level of, you know, where did we see the country going? And I said, well, you know, admittedly, I, I'm kind of in my my own nationalist groups online. And so I, I'm in a little bit of a bubble that way. And so I do see a lot of people really coming to the the conservative side, the the, the right side of things and, and really, you know, um, you know, I see a lot of people getting red pilled and, and and changing their thoughts and their views. And I said, but you know what, sometimes I think, well, that's just my viewpoint because I'm in this little bubble where, I, where I'm at on Gab or wherever. But then when I go into my normal everyday life, I do come up against some, some far radical leftists in places that I didn't imagine like church or other places. But for the most part, I'm actually kind of blown away about how many people will, you know, once they, you know, once somebody meets me and then they find out who I am and kind of what my background is and, and how the, the, the media attacked me and whatever for saying, you know, just normal things like I'm not ashamed of my race and, and I think that families are a good thing and how, how viciously I was attacked and stalked for that. They, they feel comfortable opening up to me. And, and I've had numerous family members, friends, associates who once they learn what my backstory is, they're like, oh, it's almost like a sigh of relief. And they're like, oh, I can tell you this. And then they'll just the confession, right? all this stuff, right? It's like confession. It all is. This stuff. So they're like, I've been feeling this for 10, 20 years. And, and I think you're right about the 80s and 90s. And my husband and I talk about this 
quite often because both of us lived through it. You know, I remember watching the Cosby show and it never even really, aside from a few times that they brought up maybe some, some famous black musicians or something. I didn't even think of that family quote unquote as black. Do you know what I mean? I enjoyed the show. I still enjoy the show. I watched the show on Amazon prime, but I, I enjoyed the show as a really good, funny family show. And the same thing with family matters, which was another black show. And I had friends of different races and in the nineties in high school, and it was really funny because it, I, again, didn't, aside from when uh, occasionally things would come up, I had a friend from El Salvador and, you know, maybe she would have her quinceanera or something. Then it would come up that, oh yeah, you know, she's, she has this culture. Oh, cool. You know, that's her culture. But it, it wasn't even something that we really harped on or it, there was no division. There was no like, it was really this kind of magical time where we had this equilibrium. It was really interesting. And then all of a sudden things started getting progressively more radical and people started calling me racist for holding these views that I had, even as a, when, when I was more liberal in the early 2000s. And I started going, wait a minute, I'm not a, I'm not a racist. I'm looking back and I well, at first, at first, you know, when I felt personally attacked, I would go, oh my gosh, am I a racist? And then I was like, I don't, I don't have non-white friends. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, no, that's actually not true. I have lots of non-white friends. I just don't think of them in racial categories. So it just like never occurred to me. And I sat there and I went, wow, like a vast, like half of my friends are, aren't even white. I'm like, I'm not a racist. What's going on with our world? It was, and that's when I started looking and going, okay, I know that I'm not a racist, but now suddenly my views are considered racist. And I have, you know, the same views that I had as, uh, for the most part as a liberal, like in the nineties. So what's going on here? And it was, it was this very deliberate radical change that started happening in the two thousands. And, and um, I think that that's really interesting that you point out that this is something that they've done you know, over and over again in the past that they've gone, they've targeted disaffected groups to create this, uh, this, you know, break apart where social cohesion was beginning to happen and people were, you know, doing for themselves to break them apart in order to gain power and control. And one of the, speaking of homeschool, one of the books I'm always recommending people read, and I think this, these, this series had a tremendous effect on my development, is Little House on the Prairie. And one of the, you know, when I was a little girl, my mom read me the whole series in bed every night. We just went through every book. And then later on, I read them again and, you know, the TV show and all of that. But then as an adult, and I started reading them to my kids, mostly out of nostalgia because my mother had read them to me. I thought, wow, these are very libertarian kind of values that are in this book. And then I found out that that's why she read it or wrote it. The uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder had, had wrote it at the behest of her daughter, who was very active in the libertarian movement because they saw this new deal thing starting to happen in the 1930s. And her, her daughter said, mom, you got to tell people how it used to be and how people did for themselves. Communities did for themselves. Families did for themselves and, and how it worked because people are going to forget because they're, they're covering up this history. They're lying about it and they want people dependent on the government. And that's why the little house on the prairie series even exists. And, and I had no idea. And it had such an effect on me and I, I always recommend it, but I, you know, so going along with, with your book, I, I can see how, they have been doing this forever. And if we don't capture that the way Little House on the Prairie did, if we don't capture that truth, um, it, it's, it just ends up getting lost. And right now in this digital age, they, they just, like I said in the beginning, they just start scrubbing it from Google. And then, and then we don't even know that people used to do for themselves that, you know, I, I'm getting worried that it's going to get to the point where people don't even know. And, and it's already to this point in some far left groups, people don't even know that that families, you know, used to exist and be happy. You know, it, when sometimes when I bring that up, people attack me. Oh, that was that was a lie of the you know 1950s propaganda. You know, the the nuclear family was never happy, and children were abused, and fathers were tyrants. And I'm like, no, that literally, you know, one one of the things I saw come out a couple of years back was this notion that husbands were like mass um, spanking their wives in the 1950s. There was this meme going around on Facebook amongst feminists and even conservatives that like, oh, are, is it, are we so glad that we got out of that era? And I went, I really don't think men were like beating their wives on like a regular basis in the 1950s. I said, why don't, instead of believing a Facebook meme, why don't we just go ask our grandmas? Like they're still alive, most of them. Like, can we go out, you know, and I did, I asked my grandma who's still alive. I was like, was this a problem in the 50s? And she's like, no, <laughs> like that was not a common thing, <laughs> you know? Um, she said, aside from maybe somebody who's doing that in the bedroom um, for fun, she's like, no, there was no like mass problem of like the hidden world of 50 you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So it's so interesting how they do this. And so I'm so happy that, that you've written this book. Um, and so for those of you who are just tuning in, um, I let you know, I'm interviewing Tom Kaczynski. He was the um, man who was fired up in Maine from, from his government position for being uh, anti anti-illegal immigration and, uh, you know, questions about Islam and not being ashamed to be white. He has written a new book called Someone Had to Say It, and it is about the lost history of America. And he's been sharing that with us today. And I have the link um, to the book is in the description box if you want to cl click on that and add that to your library. I highly recommend it. And like I say with a lot of things, get the print edition if you can afford it, because I really do think that if the left continues to get control, they are going to be scrubbing a lot of digital stuff. So if you're relying on just having this, this library on your Kindle, I, I would highly, highly recommend that you get print copies of these sorts of books and, um, and build your library. And even if you don't have children yet, but you're planning on having children, please get this book now because you're going to want to be able to teach your children real history. One of the problems I've come in in uh, that I've experienced as a homeschooling mother is trying to find good history books, even conservative written books these days. Um, their history is is it, just it, not based on fact and it, it's real garbage. So make sure you add this to your library as a hard copy. If you can afford it, please, please do. Um, you won't regret it. I promise you. So Tom, let's see. Uh, what else would you like to tell tell everybody about this? One piece to that too. Um, it is for sale on Amazon right now. But if you don't like to purchase through Amazon, which uh, many people don't, um, mm -hmm. if you contact me at nationalright.us, I can find a way to get that to you directly. We can do it through uh, you know electronic transfer or check money order. However, people like. I'm happy to autograph it. Uh, usually, it's twenty five dollars if you do it that way. Costs a little more because I have to pay for the shipping, but uh, Definitely happy to get that to anyone interested. And uh, one thing about the book I think people should know is it's really written in a very friendly conversational tone. It's designed to be a two or three hour read where you basically get a glimpse into the sort of questions you should be asking. So you can go deeper into the issues that uh, really prompted us, the rise of the banks, the rise of the welfare state, the rise of the military state. Uh, social disorder of the 1960s and a lot about what we've been talking about today in the 90s. So um, it doesn't go too deep into any of them to be onerous, but I think uh, people would get a lot from it. And the one thing I've had people tell me who've read it so far is that they think it's perfect for reaching out to that person who isn't there yet, that moderate who still has faith in the system, you know, like, like you were talking about, Ayla. Mm -hmm. If you were a moderate in 1990s, you're halfway to being a far rightist today because you didn't move, the society moved underneath you. And I think the one point I want people to, to know is that, you know, America has been set up to fail in this sense that you can usually have a country that's either multi-ethnic or multicultural you can't really do both. And we had a country that had a single common culture of responsibility, family, hard work, respect for the family, and these were universal values. They weren't racial values. After the 90s, that started to change, you know, with, with uh, some of these movements to redefine gender, uh, the gay marriage thing, uh, radical minorities. And, and, you know, they were radicalized against the majority um, by a group of people on the left. a real problem um, going forward because what they're doing is they're bringing in more minorities who come from different cultures knowing this will exacerbate some of the conflicts in our society and and this is the part that, that sometimes gets lost in this is that it's a global battle and the United States is a problem we are a country of free thinking people who believe in liberty and have a ton of guns so in a lot of ways, the global elites would have no problem with seeing America collapse because EU is very much communist at this point. China is avowedly communist. And when you look at the other power centers around the world, they already control them. And that's the one thing that gives me a lot of pause for today, which is that America stands alone in many ways. And the American people stand alone against our government and against our deep state. And when you can see, like I did in my book, how this has been done over 70 years, 
you really have to hope that Trump is successful, the deep state is constrained. But while you're doing that, you need to be meeting with people in rooms, in your neighborhood, and having those conversations where after you get to know people, you can say to them, honestly, look, this isn't quite what we want. Let's make sure we take care of our own. And as we do that, more people become informed. We can elect better people. Hopefully, we can solve things politically. And God forbid, should things come to their worst outcome, we can protect our families and protect our values, which is what I think we may need to do. Um, it's very different than how people like to think about the world. And I try to be an optimist. I think you can live a much better life by working within your community and reaching out to people. But it's the sort of optimism that's also prepared for outcomes which we wouldn't like to see. And I always tell people that's how you need to be thinking. And, and, and as someone who lives in a very rural part of Maine and enjoys that, I would say if you want to find good people, consider moving to the country if your means allow. And if your means don't allow, change your means. <laughs> because you're going to be happier. You're going to see all these compromises you don't have to make. I, uh, I had to drive down to Boston last week, for instance, and it took me three hours to drive 20 miles with a bunch of people screaming and mad at each other. And I'm like, these are not people anymore. And, and I, I'm not meaning to cast dispersions on them, but the hive mentality of living in cities, of being apart from the land, of being apart from nature, makes us accept things as normal, which really aren't. This idea that we can just be interchangeable entities who live in cubicles, that's not humanity. That's not our past. And God willing, that's not our future. It's like going to one of those big agriculture farms where all the chickens are in little cages to the day they mm. die. That's what's being planned for us by the left because they are obsessed with equality. And there's two forms of equality in human history, death and squalid poverty. You know, and usually one follows the other. So, you know, if we don't want that, we need something different. And that for yourself, your family, have some kids and enjoy it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's why the family unit comes so under attack. Because once you have a strong family unit, you've got a mom and a dad and a couple of kids, and they are, you know, living and loving and learning together, and they're going to church and they're active in their community, then you're bonding together these individual family units then suddenly become a community. They're helping one another. There's no one from the state that needs control of that. If a father was to die in a car accident, suddenly, you know, um, God forbid, then the community and the church and, and the organizations within that community and the other families would step up and, and help that woman and, and help her children. And that was the way we used to do things. And, and there was really no need for, for, you know, any kind of state other than maybe, you know, some, some basic uh, uh, civil Have defense. Have an army protect the borders. That's right. But, you know, protecting the borders. Right. You know, and um, you know, even back to I mean, medieval times, a lot of times, you know, you had your little, your individual family units, you know, the, for the most part, the king wasn't really even bothering with a lot of the individual people so much as, you know, kind of his job was to make sure that the castle walls were pretty sturdy and you guys weren't getting invaded. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting. I think that that's very much how white Western society developed. And obviously that's a big part of the American spirit um, is, is, joining, you know, having a, a strong family and then joining together with other families and taking care of each other. And so that is going to be the first and foremost thing that the state attacks. And, and like you said, with welfare, we've seen them do that. And they first, it was the black family. <clears throat> they destroyed the black family by getting the dads out of the home and getting the moms on welfare and, and everything that's, you know, gone downhill for them in the past 70 years. And then now, you know, they're, they're turning to all families and, in and, and um, doing that to all, all families that they can in our country. And, and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that's an important part. And I like that you mentioned that the book is kind of like, it doesn't get it, you know, into the deep history necessarily itself. It, it sets it up where it helps people to ask the right questions and get them thinking on, on the right track. Like, oh, well, why, why is this happening? And what, you know, what is the pattern here? And I think that's perfect. And particularly for those out there who may have teenagers that they're, they're trying to educate. Cause I think one of the things that homeschoolers come up against with teens is that if you kind of just hand a teenager all you know the information uh completely bundled and packaged they tend to have that teen you know that's eh, what mom believe you know that's mom stuff kind of reaction and if you give them instead a tool to ask the right questions 
and they're able to then kind of follow up on this line of thinking themselves, mm -hmm. um, then that is a really great way for them to educate themselves. Then they take ownership and responsibility of that education. It feels like, okay, this is their belief system that they've come to, not something that mom, you know, forced on me, mom and dad through homeschool, you know, forced me to believe this set of, you know, strict tenets. It, it more becomes the ownership of it. And so I think that that's really great that you wrote the book in that way. And I would also just as an aside, advocate that um, if you're used to having your children go to sleep by uh, maybe having a TV in their room or, or things like that, I really, really strongly advocate that you make sure that they have silence at bedtime so that they are able to sit and process their day and process information like this. This is one of the ways that we've been disconnected from figuring things out is that we've been raised for a few generations where there's constant media, whether it was at first the television was constantly going, people are falling, you know, eating, eating in front of the TV, falling asleep in front of the TV. And then now we have the phones and the internet and it's just constant stimulation. We never take that time to sit and process. And that's how children learn a lot about the world is they take their daily experience through reading books like this. And then just even from their interactions with their friends, playing outside, what happened when they climbed the tree that day, whatever it is. And they sit in bed at night and they go through this learning process of, of processing that information. And if we take that away from them, that space to be able to, to process that, then, um, they can't come to any conclusions. They can't gain the wisdom that they otherwise would from their their experiences, from their life experiences, as well as their educational experiences. So I would just add that as an aside for parents that are thinking about using um, this book in homeschooling, make sure that your kids aren't, you know, got the earphones in or something like this on their iPod when they're going to sleep. Make sure at least several nights a week that they're going to sleep um, in silence so that they're able to process things and really think deeply about it. So I think that that's really great that that's the way that, that you wrote this book. So what was, let's get, um, so was it your experience that really led you to write this book? The, the recent experience of, of, you know, being outed as not ashamed of your race and, and all and, and as a conservative white man in, in our society, was it really that experience or was this a book that kind of has been formulating in your mind for a while? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, for a long time, I've been having a number of conversations with people about why things happen the way they do. And people have told me for many, many years, you should write a book. You know so many things that people don't know. Why don't you write the book? And my answer was always, well, if I wrote what I actually thought, I'd never be able to get hired again. <laughs> it hasn't worked out. The book was in my mind for a very long time, but now that uh, I've already suffered the consequence, there's a strange thing that happens where you sort of end up beyond rebuke, right? I mean, you know this better than anybody. Is. Yeah. <laughs> when you become an avatar for a movement larger than yourself, the best thing you can do is speak honestly to what you believe. And, you know, when I made the decision that I was going to fall on my proverbial sword to accomplish these things, I uh, knew it would be a great time to write the book. And uh, I wrote it for two reasons. Number one, because it's a story people need to know. They need to understand what happened in American history. Um, you know, I was a history major when I went to college, graduated with honors in it. So I spent a lot of time studying this and I learned there was a lot of things that are taught that just aren't true. I mean, a lot of history, um, is narrative and theory, right? And, I, and I'm very clear about this in my book that I've created a narrative as well, but I think my narrative fits the facts and where we've gone, and it explains it much better than the Marxist narrative or cultural narratives that are out there. And, you know, the readers can decide, but, you know, if you're watching this podcast, odds are your uh, views are much closer to ours than, uh, than what's out there. But the second reason why I did it is because, as you know, I am an activist, I'm a speaker, I go out, I do things and I network, and people often ask me, why do I do it? What is this about? And I found it incredibly useful um, so that when I talk to the media who doesn't, you know, accepting shows like this that don't give me a fair shake, I can say, if you really want to know what I think, look at the book. And the book is there for that part of it, and it's there really before two other things are going to come out, which is um, I work on an organization now called the National Right, which I've created. It's www.nationalright.us. Um, encourage everyone to take a look at it. And on there, we have a set of 10 values we call the American Covenant, which is designed to 
get the right united so that we can oppose the Marxists who are doing this. And these are common sense values uh, rooted in our tradition and liberty. Uh, we have four key values, which are responsibility, liberty, morality, and identity. We feel like you should be proud of who you are, work hard, work to promote the right values and go forward. And I network people. Um, I'm very fortunate in that maybe my political experiences have made me able to speak to people with somewhat different mindsets on the right in a way that uh, is authentic of all their concerns, understanding that our differences are much smaller than the things that bring us together. Um, because I, I think one of the things that people need to get uh, that the right has kind of failed on, and, and this comes to the heart of what you and I have been talking about today, is that the individual isn't the base unit of society. It's the family. Mm -hmm. An individual atomized by itself is a dead end, biologically, socially, and culturally. You know, a mother and a father can raise a child, provide welfare, an extended family can solve these problems organically where we don't have to have the state. And the absence of the state is liberty. It's the freedom that we want. And, you know, the reason why we have the state is because we've lost a culture war. And so I've delved into this culture war and I will continue to do so. Um, the national rights, a start with that. And um, right now I'm considering heavily writing a second book to answer the question I'm always asked of, which is, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. And such a book probably will be less optimistic um, because hard times are ahead. And if we are really honest, we probably never are going to reach the majority. We don't control the media. We don't control the schools. We fight within our families. We have these issues. But if we can reach enough people and work between ourselves, we can live a better life and we can become the nucleus of the force that reaches that next generation or takes the action needed if our liberties are tried too far to sustain this generation. And I know the road I'm walking is pretty dangerous um, of necessity, and I'm trying to do this as tactfully as I can, which is a little <laughs> bit of a challenge because the number of hate lists that I'm on is absolutely amazing for a person mm. who can laugh more than yell. But <laughs> the state finds people like us incredibly dangerous because we're trying to find a way to not need them so much. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes us enemies. You know, you can murder someone. I, I think of the example of, was it uh, down in Charlottesville, Jacob Goodwin, you know, what happened with him? You know, we see people murder people who get off with a few years on manslaughter. And this guy gets 10 years for what they call it, malicious kicking. I mean, yes, yes, when, he was, when he was attacked first, first. yeah, it, it's absolute insanity. And, and the thing is, you can't win by lawfare because the state is corrupt. Mm -hmm. And I tend to think that's why politics won't work. The judges are bought and, and you can go in. The book goes into the details of how this happens and why this happens. But when it changes, which is, I think, what people are more concerned about is when you can solve problems between yourselves, with your neighbors, with your community, within your family, and you work towards independence. You know, I work with a lot of homesteaders up here in Maine. Um, a lot of people have moved up here. They say we're economically doing poorly. What they don't see are the thousands of people who are moving up here to live off-grid lifestyles intentionally mm -hmm. uh, in recognition of what's coming because they want a better life. And I'll, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a story. I was up in um, far northern Maine, which, you know, you don't think of Maine as a big state, but even where I live, this was six hours from me, literally a stone's throw from the Canadian border. And I met uh, a gentleman who was from Europe, or who was an American who had a European wife. And she, uh, they had lived there in, in a country which had had major issues, uh, a Scandinavian country, okay? And in those countries, if you spoke out, you went to jail. And the government would put Muslims into every town, no matter how small. If there were 100 people, you got your percentage. And they didn't want to be there, and the people didn't want them there, but the government didn't care because they were there to enact an agenda. And the agenda was to destroy any social unity that people could experience so that no one would question the state. Because if you're busy fighting one another, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And these people, God bless them, were willing to leave and they have a beautiful family and now they live there in, in, in rural Maine. But I remember the gentleman was telling me he felt badly that he wasn't able to lead the fight up there because they couldn't win that. Yeah. And Ten years ago, they weren't having those problems up there. I mean, this happened very quickly. And it could happen quickly here, too. You know, eight years of Obama showed how quickly it could happen. And Trump has given us a respite, and a lot of people are counting and hoping on good things from the administration. I hope for good things, too. But they may not happen. There are other forces working against this. 
And we help him and we help ourselves by not assuming anything other than what we work for and what we make happen. And so that's really what I hope people do. And that's what I work on, figuring out ways to do that and to reach out to people. I mean, I, I've gone from living a more comfortable lifestyle to a more modest one, but it's an honest one and I take pride in it. And uh, my wife, Dana, and I fight hard for this. I know you're you're familiar with her and you know what a warrior she is. So. She is an amazing woman and a total sweetheart. You are so blessed. I, I absolutely am. And I know she's watching this right now. So <laughs> I'm missing her. She's away visiting her parents for a couple of weeks. But yes. uh, letting me do all my media. But uh, that's what it takes. Men and women working together, right? I mean, what yeah. do we need to do? We need to roll back the state. We need to reclaim the family. We need to win white women back. Yes. I mean, you're leading the effort there. You know, this MGTOW thing isn't getting it done. I hate to say it. I mean, I understand guys are frustrated, um, you know, but at the end of the day, the family is the social unit and half a person is no person at all. That's yeah. what we Oh, good. I was going to say, I think that you and Dana are such a wonderful example, too, because I know through circumstances, not your your fault, you can't have um, children of your own. But Dana is such an amazing uh, becoming such an amazing auntie to my children. And, you know, she puts together little books and packages and things to send them. And, you know, I think it's so wonderful that even if you're an individual person or a married couple who can't have children or don't have children yet, you can get involved in building up the family unit in, in our society. And when we make these connections where we have this like broader extended community and family, then then we're able to um, like you said, to network, we don't we don't need to rely on on the government. We don't their their influence and even even the influence of the SJWs who try this kind of lawfare system, you know, pe getting people fired and everything. But if we're creating our own businesses, if we're supporting each other, you know, if a, if a, if someone in our movement starts a, you know, a company selling, you know, coffee or what bread or whatever they're doing, if we're intentionally putting our dollars that way and building up our own financial resources, building up our own community, supporting families within, within the community. Yeah. Then there's no reason, even for those who can't, you know, haven't found a partner or whatever it is, don't go MGTOW. Like you can be yeah. part of a family. You can be part of a family. You are part of a family. And um, I have a couple of friends who don't have children of their own who, you know, who, who have become like family in, in my children's lives. And it's so important because then also people like you and I, we have family who have distanced themselves from us because we're speaking out about these issues. And so it kind of, you know, it, it works together that we, that, that, that other people, as we come together as a community, it fills in those gaps for people like you and me, who have our real names out there and our, our real lives are, are out there and who, who have lost things. And then we gain things through our new community and, and it really works out. And I think it's really important what you said about, you know, where we, we might be the people that kind of are like hold out in these little groups, holding on to these values so that then they can, you know, there's kind of a, a place for this, this knowledge to, to be so that when it needs to come back in a more massive way, it can, or people who just want access to it can still have it because, you know, as the Bible says, it, narrow is is the path to heaven and, and wide is the path to hell. And I like to think about society the same way. We're probably never going to overwhelmingly win the majority of, of society because wide is the, is the gate to hell. But a narrow path, if we stay on that narrow path and we're bringing in the support, we're networking together and we're supporting other people on that narrow path, we can get by on that narrow path. And it might be a time when we're kind of like literally going back into the catacombs the way the original Christians did to, to have to hide from, from the evil and the degeneracy of the world around us that, that wants to persecute us. But if we can, we can learn from that and we can, we can hold that, that little ember alive and keep this information alive. Um, one of the great examples is the Amish community, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, they decided that, the progress they were seeing coming about in modern life was something that was taking away from family and family time and family values. And so they shunned a lot of these new um, technological things that were coming out and they, and they continue to do so. And a lot of people don't realize that the, the reason the Amish do that, they, the Amish aren't like LARPing as, you know, somebody from the 1800s, the way that they have their lifestyle set up is they shun things that, 
take away from the community and the family. So for example, if, if, if one person is able to put on like really expensive designer clothing and whatever, then that kind of creates a disharmony within their community. So they say, you know what, we're all going to kind of have this one style of dress. And so that's why. And then of course it's a modest style of dress for, for obvious reasons. And then, you know, as new technology comes along, their, their local community bishop decides, you know, I think that pulls away from the family or it doesn't. So that's why you see in different Amish communities, like some are allowed to have phones if they need it for business, but it has to be in a little phone shack at the, at the very edge of their property. So that means that, that you can't just sit on the phone and talk all day and ignore your chores and your responsibilities and your family. If you want to use the phone, you need to make kind of a deliberate effort to schedule that time, go out to your phone booth, call who you need to call to buy a cow or whatever you're trying to do, and then go back to your family. And and they do the same with a lot of the new phone technologies too. Now, you know, if you have to have a smartphone because you're an Amish man who runs a business and you employ non-Amish people, well, that's fine. But the phone stays at work or, you know, whatever. They have these rules. And, and they've been able to preserve a lot of um, community examples and educational examples and family harmony examples that we can now draw from when we read resources written by them or or you know I even get some of their homeschool resources they they sell them if you right away for the catalogs they'll send you their magazines and things and we can pull resources now from them and they've kind of held on to this this notion of and a lot of the things I've learned I've learned from them and so if we can become that for the for the larger society where we're kind of holding on to these nuggets of truth this knowledge this ember mm -hmm. so that at any point it can build back up to a bonfire and a flame again, you know, that's great. But for now, if we network and I really encourage people, you know, make this a priority in your life because there is nothing, there's nothing more important than to, you know, create a family, be involved in family and be involved in community and, and keep this information safe and keep it alive. And I actually heard of a family recently who's moving all the way across country to be with another family that they that they love and that they they had a, a, a church organization with and that they, you know, the children were friends and, and they have this idea of having a community garden together and everything. And the family that's moving, they're, you know, it's kind of people are, well, why are you moving across country? You don't have a job yet. You don't have this, you don't have that. And, but they know what's important. And that was so inspiring to hear that story recently about this family that's like, no, I know what's important. And it's important to have the community. It's important for our friends to have or our children to have good friends. It's important to to try to be self sufficient and get to where we can have a big community garden and and all of these things. And so make it a priority. Take those risks. Uh, that would be a huge um, uh, thing that I would advocate for people. You know, don't don't shy away from it and um, support each other. Would you agree? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why we're up here in Maine, you know, uh, that uh, and there's a growing network up here. You know, if you don't know where to go, I can tell you Maine is a good place, uh, especially once you get north of Portland and Lewiston. Uh, very good. And, and you know, like you said, there, there are networks that form and a lot of stuff you don't see happens by barter. It's communication. It's kids, you know, and it's a lot like the Amish ordinal, right? I mean, Dana and I are both from Pennsylvania, so we know a lot about the Amish and how they live. And they, they do have their priorities in order, and they ask if things benefit them or not. I mean, it's crazy that we live our lives to the dictates of technology rather than asking if the technology itself is good for us. I think, I think you're spot on with that sort of analysis of it. And it's, it's something we need to do, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and it's a conversation you and I should have going into the future, you know, publicly as well as privately. But how do we get people to have the joy of that experience, you know? Like I know everyone always goes when they try to talk politics and they have these big events and they have these marches and stuff. And, and, and you know, they, they hope for like a European type solution, right, where we have a ton of people marching through the streets, you know, you know, storming the barricades like it's 1830 all over again. You know? But it's not going to look like that in America. In America, it's probably going to look like a big tent where you have people who like to go mudding and line dancing. And maybe you, you celebrate who has the cutest kid. And you have someone get up there, talk about God and, and talk about Christ and his message of salvation, but of his salvation for the nations that stand up for themselves, not mm -hmm. this uh, ecumenical universalism where we just are expected to give up our society and our culture. I think that's a balance. And where we have people say, hey, you should be proud of your culture. European culture is fantastic. We all come from different backgrounds, you know. We all have something to celebrate. And American culture, honestly, is a European culture. Um, we're a little different. We're a little rougher. We're more frontier. 
but I think people would love to gather like that. And having sat in the room with people before, I've kind of learned that rather than making it always political, it's a lot better often to just make it social where mm -hmm. you're there and you can just talk and get to know each other and know what you care about. And, you know, if you have the wives go and have a gardening club or that they go and help each other raise children, or if you even have husbands, you know, that just uh, shoot for fun or, you know, maybe they go work on a farm. Well, then that's a real connection. And as you build that trust and independent, then you can talk about other things. And the politics starts to solve itself because you don't really need what they're offering anymore. You have something better, self-reliance. And, and that sort of independence is what we need. And so up here, you know, New England's kind of a crazy place, right? Radical ideas come out of here. We've had a couple revolutions, you know, including the one that started this country. And there days ahead, but hopefully it'll be something good. And whatever it is, uh, you can count that it'll have the family at the center of it. Um, and that, you know, when we look out for our people, you know, I hope all Americans succeed, but seeing how white people have been targeted so much, we have a lot of white people up here who are pretty proud to be that, and we will continue fighting for them as we would for all our families. Yes, exactly. And I think that, I think it was Andrew Breitbart who said, you know, politics is downstream from culture. And when you change the culture, you change the politics. And that's something that the Marxists knew a long time ago that the uh, more conservative right-leaning Christians did not realize. And I think that we need to get on boat with that, get on that boat and realize that it really is more influential to change the culture than it is to change the politics. And a lot of people are always saying, well, you, you know, you don't believe in women in politics and things like that. Why are you speaking out? And I said, I'm speaking out mostly culturally. I mean, it's not that I don't have an, a, a political opinion. Certainly I supported Donald Trump when he ran and things like that. But I think one of the reasons that I'm shut down so often, you know, they killed my, my Twitter account with 40,000 followers last year. And, and they, and they, they, they also, um, they took my Twitter account down three days before Christmas. I don't think that that was a coincidence. They were taking me down because they knew that I was going to be posting pictures of me and my happy six children having a wonderful, simple family Christmas with a few nice toys and a nice family dinner with extended family and, you know, snow and cinnamon rolls and all the rest of it. And that is more threatening to them than if I was to stand up and start talking about vote this and blah, 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 because what it shows is that you can have a large family on a small income. You can be happy. The children can be happy, even though they're not getting new uh, Game Boy, or well, I guess Game Boy, that's pretty dated, new new video technology, whatever the new video technology stuff is, that that isn't what makes a family happy. And so, the, you know, I've had, for example, my Pinterest account is probably the one I've had taken down the most often. And I think I've had, I've had maybe five or six accounts killed on Pinterest. And that's because that's where the moms are. And I'm not pinning actually anything political on Pinterest. In fact, my last Pinterest, I was very specific that the only boards I had were related to Bible quotes, nothing political at all. Absolutely nothing. It was, you know, art projects from my homeschool. It was this, it was that. You're blacklisted. But I'm, yeah, but I'm blacklisted because they know a bunch of moms are on Pinterest and that that affect, Pinterest is a huge thing that affects mom culture. The same as Facebook. Facebook is, again, I think I've been taken down four or five times on Facebook. In mm. fact, my posting my face on a Facebook page is considered against their terms of service because my face is considered hate speech. And so they understand that what I'm talking about is more cultural. I'm showing that what they're saying isn't true, but I am I am a living embodiment, myself and my family, of the opposite of what Marxism is teaching. And and they can't they can't allow that. They can't allow that information to be out there that you can be a happy, you know, large family, uh, you know, doing for yourselves and 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 also the message that I used to be a leftist and a feminist and that I went to graduate school in San Francisco, but that I came out of that and I got out of that. Those are two huge messages that completely destroy the Marxist narrative. And so that's why they want to to shut me down. And I so I think you're a hundred percent correct when you when you say we need to be doing this at a cultural level and at a local level. Um, even before we put the emphasis on politics, not that politics don't matter. And I encourage everyone to get out and vote and definitely support conservative politicians. 
but we are going to have to change the culture first. That that's where it's going to come because that's that's where people react emotionally. Most people aren't sitting at home trying to logically figure out, you know, um, what candidate to vote for. They're voting their feelings and their feelings come from their culture. And if they have warm, fuzzy, good-hearted feelings about a healthy white American family or just even a healthy American family, regardless of the race, then they're going to vote for that. They're gonna vote for policies that protect that, that protect those communities, that protect Christians, that protect large families, etc. If they have a negative feeling, if they really think that all of our grandmothers were getting beaten by their husbands, if they really think that the 1950s was this huge propaganda from far right Nazi politicians to make the family look like a wonderful thing that it wasn't, if they think that, then anytime anybody mentions family values or anything like that politically, they're going to automatically shut down and say, I don't want to vote for that candidate. You know, he, he sounds like a radical Nazi, you know. And so we definitely have to change the cultural, the cultural thought. We have to get those warm, fuzzy, emotional feelings back where they should be around faith and family and farmland. Well, you know, it's funny. I brought up my book. I'm going to read you one quote if I can find it real fast for you because, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the 1950s, and I, I wanted to share a quote. This is from Joseph McCarthy, right? Mm. He was demeaned as the most evil and wicked man out there. And I, 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 will, I want to read this because it's the only quote I put in the whole book because I thought it was this important. Because he was This indicates the swiftness of the tempo of communist victories and American defeats in the Cold War. As one of our outstanding historical figures once said, when a great democracy is destroyed, it will not be from enemies without, but rather because of enemies from within. The reason we find ourselves in a position of impotency is not because our only powerful potential enemy has sent men to invade our shores, but rather because of the traitorous actions of those who have been treated so well by this nation. It has not been the less fortunate or members of minority groups who have been traitors to this nation, but rather those who have had the benefit of all the benefits that the wealthiest nation on earth has had to offer. The finest homes, the finest education, and the finest jobs in government we can give. This is glaringly true in the State Department, which was their deep state. There, the bright young men who are born with silver spoons in their mouths are the ones who have been the most traitorous. And I share that with you because you've been told in history this was the worst man out there. Mm -hmm. They had the same struggle 70 years ago, and the same thing happened. The media painted him as a Nazi, as a terrible figure. And if you look at the history of most of what McCarthy said, it ended up being true because yeah. it really is our government against us. It's the well-educated. You went to a liberal school. So did I. I was around a lot of socialists and could speak their language. And that makes us even bigger apostates because you know how those fights go. And you can reverse engineer their arguments. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's based on radical idealism, right? It's based on this idea they want to have that all people are equal. And no two people are equal because no two people are the same. Mm -hmm. And... You know, one thing that you learn as you go through life is that as much as we want to have a world with reason, the truth is it's a world of instincts and we use reason to cleverly justify what we do. Yeah. But in that, I find hope because there are healthy instincts within us that are being suppressed. You know, it is our nature to want to find a partner. It is our nature to want to have children and to have a family and to be close to the land and to, you know, be to do work that's meaningful to us you know people who push papers all day and as i say this is someone who did it for 10 years there's an emptiness that you can't resolve and all the drugs in the world you know and all the distractions they can provide don't solve that and as we begin to put that out there the one thing that always gives me hope is we fight a massive terrible system they control the finance they control the media they control everything but they have to because what they give us is fundamentally unnatural humanity in general, and I think Americans in particular strive for excellence. And that sort of quality is the very opposite of equality, but it is fundamental to our nature. It's hardwired into us of generations of survivors and of the inspiration of our faith, of, of Christ, that teaches us to be better men and women. And so in all of that, there is so much that we can draw upon if we can just step outside of these blinders they've put on us. And as people do this and see others succeed, Yes, there will be those who are envious, but we can grow very, very quickly. 
And I think therein lies the great hope for us that, you know, we might find that better life not 10 years from now or 20 years from now, but really quickly. We just need a little bit of help. And if we get it from each other, I believe we can find a way to do it. So um, that might be overly optimistic, but someone has to be optimistic because we've been told we are a people who should be ashamed of our past. All we can enjoy, do is enjoy whatever sensual pleasures are in the, the present and that we should not have and do not deserve a future. So let's paint a future for ourselves, a future where Americans are married again and where children are raised with loving parents and where, you know, that there are those joys. And it doesn't have to be, you know, the Amish solution, but it should ask the question about whether or not what we do fits what we want from our lives. And as people do that, you know, the left has a lot of complaining, but there's a reason why they keep importing people. They're not having people. Their people have a death wish because their life has no meaning. And as they see that, maybe even some of them will be rescued because there was a time long, long ago where maybe I was a little leftist then or two. And I know that people over there uh, don't have, they're not getting what they want. And that's why they're so angry and there's so many movements. They're not satisfied because they're fighting their nature. And you can only do that so long. So if we go ahead and give them a better option, I think that's when we start winning this culture war. And it took a lot for us to be distracted away from victory. But you and I and all of us like us who are forming up in our families and our communities are making those actions. So with that, I would just say that the book is there to give you a couple more tools in your arsenal. Uh, if you look at nationalright.us, you'll learn more about what I'm doing. And if you want some basic principles in terms of where this country should maybe go, I think you'll like that. Um, it's, it's good. We work on it all the time. Uh, you all know I'm on Gab a ton because I jumped out before I got banned. I was smart like that because my Twitter account was pretty well followed once upon a time. And once Trump got elected, I knew the purge was coming and uh, it mm -hmm. continues on social media. And we continue talking there. And uh, the thing about it is, you know, accepting those few places, we're going to have a hard time being heard. I mean, I get shadow banned on Facebook and, you know, promoting the book is a challenge just because of how many places won't let me do it. But on the other hand, it's an impetus for us to do what we have to do, which is actually connect in a meaningful way. And I tell you, if we do that, you got to remember the leftists and Antifa and all them might put a ton of people in the streets, but it's only because they pay pretty well, you know? <laughs> that is for sure. So before we wrap this up, um, go ahead and tell my viewers, how can they support you? I know you're a premium, uh, a premium content creator on Gab in that they can go on Gab and, you know, subscribe to you. So, so to speak, and that will give you a few bucks a month towards your cause. Um, how, how else can people support you? Because I really want to make that, um, a big part of this emphasis, because like you said, you can't promote your book as well because you're shadow banned and, and things like that. I, I was telling my husband a couple nights ago, if I wasn't banned from every platform, I could have a mini Martha Stewart esque uh, empire media empire right now around traditional living, because that's how much demand there is for my stuff. It's just that I keep getting shut down. So if we, we got to get out there, we got to, so share this video, first of all, for all of those watching both live and, and as a recording, please share this video, uh, like it, subscribe to my channel, subscribe to Tom, Tom's things and support him. So tell us how, what is the best way people can support what you're doing and the work you're doing? Sure. And thank you for that. Um, nationalright.us will uh, show you what I'm working on. And uh, if you want to reach me, I'm at Tom at nationalright.us. Uh, anyone who wants to reach me by mail, I know a lot of people prefer that to protect their privacy. PO box 583. Jackman, Maine, 04945. Maine is M-E. And uh, Gab is my preferred social media. I love when people become premium subscribers. It's $5 a month. Uh, it helps out. Uh, the book, obviously, anyone who purchases it is very uh, helpful. I get a royalty on that. Uh, actually make the same amount on the paperback as well as the uh, the print, or excuse me, the digital version. So, But I think it is smart to have the paperback version. Uh, if you want, reach me directly to go ahead and purchase copies. And if you want to do any bulk things or anything like that, I can do special discount rates, stuff like that. And in the future, uh, in terms of other fundraisers, I probably will post another free starter. Um, I'm just not doing it right now because setting up some other things. Um, if you want to help out uh, more directly, just reach out to me. I hope you support Ayla as well. She does great work. Uh, definitely appreciate her. And 
and I can attest it is true that you know you could go ahead and have an empire. I mean, it's so bad. My wife posts a fundraiser for her Lyme disease, and they shut it down from the payment processor side. And mm. you know, the people who control finance in this country try to control speech. We can't let that happen. We got to keep speaking up, speaking out. And uh, even if you don't purchase my book, I really appreciate it. Uh, go on Amazon.com, uh, look at Someone Has to Say It, and uh, share the links. Share it on your social media. You're probably not blacklisted like I am. And let people know it's been very well reviewed. A lot of people like it. Um, any questions you have or anything, I'm incredibly easy to reach. Uh, Ayla can tell you finding me on social media only takes about five seconds of effort, and I respond uh, early and often. I like interacting with people. So I would just say thank you for that. Thank you to everyone who supported me, and thank you to you, Ayla, for uh, another great interview. And I'm sure we'll talk again in a few months here about something. And uh, always happy to promote your stuff as well and let people know what you're doing. And uh, you know, and on a personal note, I, from Dana and myself, thank you for, for being so kind to us. It really means a lot, your family, to ours. Oh, thank, oh, you, thank so you so much. I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, yeah. And, and when they shut down, down Dana's, Dana's uh, Lyme's disease fundraiser, I mean, I think that there's um, no better example that the people that we're fighting against literally want us to die. Like, they just literally do, because there's absolutely no reason to shut down a medical fundraiser for somebody because you disagree with their political or social opinions, other than you want them to die. So, I mean, um, we really have to keep, I think that helps zero in and keep in context some of the people, not all, not all, but some of the people on the far radical left that we're dealing with and what uh, measures they will go to 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 try to silence us and just simply get rid of us the institutional so left you when you look at the book you learn the institutional left that's the people who run the banks who run the media who are relatively a small class of people do have those sorts of agendas you know if you've heard of agenda 21 the Kalergi plan all of these things i touch on them in the book but do understand what ayla is saying is right the great replacement white genocide all of these things are intended because at the end of the day they want technology to replace us so they don't have to count on us and they can live in their bliss that doesn't include you. And if you don't, if you're not a part of it, it does not include you, whatever your opinions and beliefs are, whether you're left to center, right to center, white, black, brown, or you're purple, does not matter. They want it for themselves. And the thing we have to remember, and this is the hard part, is a lot of people who follow them are just useful idiots who don't know better, who haven't had the life experience, who have been indoctrinated. We can wake people up. You and I are evidence of this, and we should keep doing that because they do want us to die. They want us to die. They want us to be quiet. And, you know, everything they give us is intended just to give us comfortable hospice care to the end. And we deserve better than that. We are the inheritors of a great civilization, of a faith, that, of faith in civilizations that are eons of years old. And if we don't make it work now, it will be lost. So let's do it. Exactly. exactly, exactly. That's a tremendous note to end on. So we'll go ahead and end it there. It was great to have you on, Tom, and I'm sure we will do this again very soon. Everybody take care out there on the, in the internet world. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sharing this video. Thank you for going to wifewithapurpose.com forward slash support and finding out ways you can support the work that I do. I hope you guys have a wonderful Monday and a wonderful rest of your week. And I am really honestly and truly praying for all of you that support our movement, that um, you will grow strong. We will grow strong. We will become a community together and um, praying for everybody out there. So have a wonderful week and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.